So, uh, so Nero had appointed Florus as governor. Florus was intentionally provoking the Jews. The younger people start to rise up, become, uh, and the Zealot party increases. The Sicarii are formed, which is a group of guys that have these curved blades, and they're named after that curved blade. Uh, and they would hide it under their clothes and just walk into the festivals and uh, walk up behind somebody who was a powerful person that they wanted retribution on, and they would just slit their throat and quietly walk away. Uh, and that's who the Sicarii were, and they were became... Uh, you know, basically, in a sense, a terrorist group because they were there to to intimidate powerful people to rise up and to do what what they wanted. Mm. Most of the older Jews, as I said, and especially the Jews in power, wanted nothing to do with revolting in Rome against Rome. They there were proper channels that should have been taken. So, in other words, instead of rising up and fighting against Rome in battle. You, you go through the legal channels, you would plead to Caesar, you would write uh, things. And this happened all throughout the history of, of the Jews with Rome, where when something came up that was a problem, they just wrote to the Senate, and the Senate sat down, they heard it, and they would react. But you had to wait for that. And meanwhile, Florus was doing all of these horrible things and not coming to justice. And so uh, the Agrippa II actually gets up and gives this huge speech to, um, to not rise up to not rebel uh, and instead to uh, go through proper channels. Most of the population agrees with this, but what you're talking about is the, the older generation and the kind of the middle generation and the more passive people who aren't that active in things. So even though the majority agree, the louder group doesn't, uh, and that's the younger group, and they decide to go ahead and begin a revolt and they start fighting against Rome. Hmm. Now what happens is Cestius, uh, who is a Roman general up in Syria, uh, he comes down to intervene with all of these problems and, and uh, the revolt that's happening. Uh, meanwhile, the younger generation are trying to raise up arms, trying to, to put uh, an army together and trying to build up Jerusalem more. Uh, there's a wall that was not existing when Christ was doing his ministry that was built by Agrippa um, that they're trying to finish and, and um, get completely uh, solid. And so Cestius comes down, first he subdues Galilee, uh, which did not take long, uh, and then he lays a siege to Jerusalem. Uh, and while he's lay, laying siege to Jerusalem, he has them completely... Um, captured the group of zealots is not very well organized and uh and they were ready to let him in the the moderates were ready to let him in to take over and all that stuff and completely inexplicably he just retreats and leaves hmm. and whether he, they thought you know he needed to get more forces to do it um whether he looked at the city <laughs> and thought it couldn't be taken we, they, we don't know why he retreats. He does tear down a little bit of that wall, that, that outer wall that had been built, um, but he just turns around and leaves. Now, when he turns around and leaves and starts heading back up to Damascus, this invigorates all of the zealots in Jerusalem and this younger generation, and they pursue him, and they <laughs> actually attack him at the different places where they can surprise attack him, and they succeed. They, the, he doesn't turn and fight them. He keeps retreating. They capture a, a bunch of weapons. They capture food. They capture supplies. They capture all of this stuff from the Romans. Uh, and they bring it in Jerusalem. And now they're, they're really ready for a battle. Uh, and they are not going to go the more moderate path because they think God's provided for them to have this war. Um, now, when they get to this point, a couple of things. One... When it says in Luke 21, 20, and 22, that when you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, flee to the hills. Now, what it says in Matthew and Mark is when you see the abomination of desolation on the wing of the temple, flee to the hills. So in, uh, there are some that even would say, well, that's two different things. But it's we're going to see, I think, in a little bit that it, it's not two different things exactly. Luke is kind of saying it in a way that a Gentile can understand because he's writing to a Gentile. Uh, the abomination of desolation is almost like a Hebrew code word that you know the, the, they would have understood kind of what that was, but a Gentile would not. And so Luke just kind of says, 
when you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, get out of Dodge. Um, now you'll notice in those passages, and we're going to come up on this when we get to Matthew 24, um, there are some theological backgrounds that take those passages as you know future uh, to now and at the time of the tribulation. The issue with taking it that way is that when you get to the end times with the tribulation, you can't flee to the hills and get away from that. You, you, there's no way to do that, nor would it, why is it saying just flee to the hills? And why is it saying pray that your flight might not be in winter or pray that you won't be pregnant? Well, we're not even going to be there when it comes to the end one. We're going to have been raptured out. And so why would there be these things about where to flee and, and what to pray about and so on and so forth? And that's because those passages, you know, are most likely, or at least I feel, are referring to this time. And you see these, the, the zealots that are starting to go. You see the armies surrounding Jerusalem. And we have from church tradition, it's very hard to, uh, again, get, get solid, close to the time testimony. But we do have some church fathers that say it was at this point that all the Christians left Jerusalem. So when Cestius retreated, and they had seen that army, they knew what was coming, and they all got out of Dodge, which is why very few Christians were affected by the destruction of Jerusalem in the same way as the other Jews were. Also, uh, when this this uh, retreat of Cestius happens and they, they become emboldened, the Jews decide to go and attack, attack Ascalon, uh, which is one of the towns on the... Um, uh, closer to the, the Mediterranean Sea, which was a strong Gentile town that had very anti-Jewish leanings. And so they wanted to go and they figured we can attack that and we can plunder that and we can get more supplies and everything from there. Unfortunately, they lose. However, what that does is it sets this precedent for the other Gentile cities all around, realizing, well, they're going to probably attack us. And so they attack first. <laughs> and so this begins all around that region and in other areas of the empire, a war even within individual cities where the Jews are fighting against Gentiles and Gentiles against Jews. <clears throat> so what you see then, the nations all around Judea persecuting them severely. The Greeks in Caesarea, uh, they begin to persecute the Jews, putting many to death. The citizens of Damascus, for instance, kill 10,000 Jews all in, at once. Mm -hmm. They have cities in Babylon that do this. Alexandria, uh, Egypt, they begin to persecute the Jews in cities all around the area. There are thousands of Jews being put to death uh, by the Gentiles. Now, the Jews are also putting some of them. It's an actual fight. It, isn't, it wasn't the same as, as what you would think of with the... Uh, um, um, Come on, the uh, Holocaust, where they're just kind of being led, and they nothing, uh, they weren't fighting back. They were fighting back at this time, but still there were many that were killed uh, during that time. Um, <clears throat> Emperor Nero's response uh, to the rebellion is to appoint Vespasian as proconsul of Syria. Now, Vespasian is uh, a very respected general that the army follows and he had been extremely successful in England or Britain which was difficult to be successful in and the biggest thing is he was experienced in siege warfare and they knew that coming to Jerusalem you're going to have to do siege warfare so Nero sends Vespasian to accomplish this uh, war with the Jews so it starts with Vespasian entering Galilee uh, and to show you that not all the Jews were you know rebelling uh, Agrippa actually meets him with and adds additional forces, many of those being Jews, uh, and a large number of Jews from Galilee joined Vespasian's army. And so the, the moderate Jews join the Roman side. Uh, Titus, who is Vespasian's son, arrives in Ptolemaeus with even more reinforcements from Egypt, uh, and he surprisingly came during the winter season, which they weren't expecting, and they brought with him the 5th and the 10th legions. Now, the 10th legion of Rome was like when we talk about SEAL Team 6 or something. They had the reputation everywhere of being the one you did not want to go against. Uh, and so they arrive in Galilee. And four other kings from the surrounding nations also arrive, adding to the, uh, the forces 60,000 uh, troops. And this is not including all the slavesmen who would fight. So this is a huge army that's coming in. 
Uh, this is more than what we had as U.S. soldiers in Korea when I was there. Uh, and so they come in to subdue this. And actually, real quick as a qualification, the four kings brought the numbers up to 60,000. There were three, um, three legions uh, plus a few more extra Romans and the slaves and then the, the forces from the kings, and it all came to 60,000. So when <clears throat> Vespasian fights, uh, it says Vespasian's initial success, and I think that it sounds like that he's not going to have success later. He, he, he has success the entire time. So uh, that's, it's, uh, But he, he comes into this area from Ptolemaeus, um, and he is coming into the Jezreel Valley, and the first place that he actually goes to is uh, Gadara. Uh, this is with the Gadarene, the, when you have the demon-possessed man stuff, it's, that's, it's that region. And one of the main reasons is because this, is, uh, this city was more Gentile, and the population was more Gentile. The zealots kind of took it, and so the Gentile population was actually calling out and asking for him to come and help. Uh, and it was a very good stronghold to kind of guard his one flank as he took the rest of Galilee. Uh, and so when he gets to uh, Gadara, uh, then Josephus flees to Tiberias. So Ti and Josephus was at, at first here in Gadara. Now Josephus is the person selected by the zealots to be the general of the entire area of Galilee. When he gets to Gadara, there are, he works with all the different cities, and it's actually, they don't all accept his leadership right away. There are some that kind of push back, and some that are uh, bothered by you know, his selection. Uh, they don't like, like either how moderate he is or, or such like that. Um, and he does tend to be more moderate as he goes about his leadership in Galilee. But there's one particular person right off the bat who does not like Josephus and his name was John and John was over the city of Geshala and he is going to rebel against Josephus even at this early state but I don't want to go into all the minutia of that but he's going to be one of the main people that lead all the way to the very end of the fall of Jerusalem. So Josephus was in Gadara, uh, uh, Gadara and he uh, flees to Tiberias. Vespasian takes Gadara and then Josephus writes to Jerusalem and basically says, okay, look, um, I just saw how big this army is, and uh, you need to tell us if you actually expect us to fight or want to surrender, because if you want us to fight, you got to send more, uh, mm -hmm. or we're not going to make it. Um, and they, he's told that they're not planning on surrendering. Uh, I don't know how many troops they actually ever sent to him. So <coughs> this is Gadara. You can actually see Tiberius from Gadara. Uh, and you can, Capernaum would be up at the other end. Uh, so as he, you know, as the Romans arrive and take it, you could, he could see it from Tiberius, and then they could look at Tiberius. Now, Tiberius was a city actually recently built at this point. Tiberius is not a major city during the time of Christ's ministry. Uh, and so when he flees to Tiberius, it is uh, still one of the more uh, important men, um, cities, um, but, uh, but he is there awaiting to find out what they want him to do. Then what they realize is that uh, um, Jatapada, these names are so weird, uh, Jatapada, which is a, a, a town closer to Ptolemaeus in what would be referred to as Upper Galilee, uh, they are, are starting to have sorties come out from the Romans and they realize they're probably next in line and they ask Josephus to come and to help. And so Josephus realizes, hey, this Jatapada is actually a pretty strong fortress, and they're going to need his, his leadership. And so he goes there to strengthen their morale and, and uh, bring some forces with them. But when, jo when Vespasian finds out that Josephus, who's the general overall of Galilee, is in that city, he's like, we're definitely going there, and we're going there right now. So he immediately goes to Jatapada and attacks. Uh, the siege of Jatapada takes 47 days. Uh, which, according to Josephus, he prophesied how many days it would take and was accurate. Uh, but he, he, he's there for a good amount of that time, and they're fighting valiantly, and they have stories of guys jumping off the walls into the battle, like you see in some Lord of the Rings movies, where I thought, you know, no one would actually do that. And then you read here, like, oh, yeah, yeah they did actually do that. Uh, but they just jump out off the walls and, they, you know, throwing rocks down on them. They would pour the boiling oil down on the guys and all that stuff that you, you've heard about. Um, 
but eventually, after fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting, uh, he begins to realize they're going to be taken, and he at first says, I should leave because I'm the general of the whole area, and they're like, no, don't leave, and so he ends up staying. Uh, but in staying, then he's there um, when Jadapada falls. Uh, he himself found this well in the town that at the bottom of the well, there was this cave off to the side. And so he went into that cave with about 14 other guys and uh, they uh, are tattled on by a woman in the city who was captured. Uh, and she says, this is where, you know, the Josephus is. So they go to the mouth of the cave <laughs> and Vespasian actually has a friend of Josephus's go and try to persuade Josephus to come out and surrender and that, you know, the Romans would honor him because they had fought so valiantly. Well, the other 14 men are like, you can't do that. We're not going to let you surrender. And Josephus actually wants to surrender. He's like, what's the use of us staying here? And he gives this long speech of why die. Um, but they're like, no, we can't do that. And so Josephus talks them into this thing of, well, let's all draw lots. And, you know, whoever uh, gets the first lot, you know, kills the guy next to him. And whoever gets the second lot kills the guy next to him. And he just did that. And it got all the way down to where it was just Josephus and one other guy based on lots. And uh, he convinced the other guy to turn themselves in. And so he did not kill himself. And he surrenders to Vespasian. And then says to Vespasian that I would like to, uh, you know, or says to the, the guys that captured him, I'd like to speak with Vespasian. And he gives them the chance to speak to him. And at that time he predicts, you're going to become emperor. And God has handed you the empire. And uh, so what Vespasian does is he keeps him prisoner but in good condition and for some reason and somehow Titus uh, Vespasian's son really kind of connects with Josephus and, and uh, so Titus makes sure that Josephus has good um, treatment but he still held a prisoner um, and uh, I think it's supposed to say rise to power but the image probably pushed it away uh, <clears throat> but the uh, basically Josephus um, is held prisoner until Vespasian finds out it was right he ends up becoming Caesar, and uh, so he ends up setting Josephus free, and that's why Josephus writes the history that we are basing a lot of this on. Oh, I forgot about my arrows. See, I have all that neat animation, I gotta remember to use it. <clears throat> so also around the same time, Trajan, not the one who becomes emperor, uh, but Trajan is sent to Joppa and Gerizim. Uh, so Joppa, uh, he goes and he fights, and there are the men come out to fight against him, and they start to lose. And they go in, and it has a double wall, and the people on the inner wall shut the doors so they don't want to risk the Romans coming in. And then the Romans block them in the outer wall, and they just did this massacre between the walls of all the other men. And so you have 15,000 slain and 2,130 taken captive. Uh, Corellius goes to the Samaritans on Gerizim, they had started to fortify uh, Gerizim where their temple was, uh, and there 11,600 are slain and none are taken captive. And so the Romans now have control of that area. And then they uh, go and they decide to attack uh, Terakei. So Terakei was a fortress that they had built on the side of the Sea of Galilee, where it was a naturally just a good uh, location for that. Um, and uh, most of the Jews had fled to, from Tiberias to Terakei. And so um, when the, the Romans went to Tiberias, so they move on up into Terakei uh, and capture it. Uh, this one actually involved a naval battle on the Sea of Galilee. So there are actually ships uh, that had gone out. And one of the things that they did as a trick was they um, put a whole bunch of ships at a far distance so that you couldn't tell how many people were in them. And then they had a few get closer and say, you know, we're here, we're going to attack you. And they realized, we can't fight that big army. Only find out the other ships only had like one or two people in them at, at the end. So it was kind of trickery that they used. Um, <clears throat> they took 1,200 old and useless uh, and just killed them in the stadium. So basically people that weren't going to be able to be sold as a slave uh, and uh, were just going to use up food, they just killed them. 6,000 of the young men were actually sent to dig the Corinthian Canal. So if you're ever, you know, sailing over in Greece and you have a chance or you're driving, you get a chance to cross the Corinthian Canal. It was started uh, by, by Nero 
Uh, they did not finish it, but when it was started, it was first started using some of the captives from this war with the Jews. Uh, and then 30,400 are given to Agrippa to be sold into slavery, uh, which curious to see, you know, I wish they had recorded what he did with those, seeing that he was a Jew um, himself. So the cities that are left up in the north that had been fortified are Gishal, Mount Tabor, and Gamla. Gamla uh, is one of the places I visited when I was in uh, uh, Israel. The next picture is one that I actually took myself. Um, but this is what's called the Masada of the North. If you, Next week we'll talk about Masada, uh, which is the last place to fall in Israel. Um, this wasn't the last place to fall in, uh, in the North, but it was one of the more difficult ones for the Romans uh, to take. As you can see, they had a very steep hill with an area that juts out about the shape of a football, and the Romans were in, encamped up above it, um, but when they finally broke in to take the city, the houses were built on the hill. So you can see here how steep that hill is. Oh, man. And you can kind of see some of the ruins here, but they're built into that hill. And the Romans were able to get in and started to fight up that hill uh, and only to have all the houses collapse. <laughs> and so about 2,000 Romans died. Uh, because as they were climbing up the hill and, and going through and everything was built in, when it collapsed, it created this landslide and killed uh, a bunch of them. Uh, as a result, you know, the Jews thought, yes, God is fighting on our side. Uh, the Romans were like, now we're really ticked. Uh, and so uh, this is actually one of the places, if you go and stand here, that both Vespasian and Titus, uh, two future Roman emperors, stood there you know, together fighting against this. Uh, um, this city, because in the end, only Titus was the one taking uh, Jerusalem. But as they were um, taking the city, you can tell that from this high perspective, the Romans were able to just kind of rain arrows down on them. Uh, the Jews, thinking that they had God on their side, launched an attack, but this great wind came up, um, and the wind was blowing their arrows back against them. Uh, and so, uh, the, but meanwhile, it was carrying all the Roman arrows all the farther, and uh, they were able to uh, break through again. And now what you can't see here is they had a wall built all the way up the side, and then a wall built up here and a fortress up on top of this rock that was built up. And with the fortress on top, it stuck up fairly high. And 5,000, about 5,000 Jews jumped to their deaths off of that fortress rather than being taken captive, uh, throwing their kids off, throwing their wife off, and then jumping themselves. Uh, and so uh, the Romans watched that and saw the fanaticism, and they're like, what do you even do with this? Uh, and so when um, once Gamla uh, is taking, taken, um, you then have Mount Tabor uh, that had a fortress uh, on the top of it. With Mount Tabor, uh, what you end up having is that Placidus is sent to take it, and he goes and he offers this peace, and he plans on it being treacherous. Uh, but the Jews also plan on being treacherous. They say, sure, we'll accept that peace. So they come down and they end up attacking instead of uh, seeking peace. But Placidus just retreats, like he wants them to retreat, and it's kind of like a little mini battle of the bulge, because as he retreats, the Jews follow, he surrounds them, takes them, and then never has to take the uh, fortress at the top of the mountain, because mm -hmm. uh, they end up uh, retiring. Now, they retire by asking uh, um, for uh, um, uh, the Sabbath to be honored, and during the middle of the night, they all run, and so uh, he finds it empty. So the last place to be taken is Geshava. And uh, <clears throat> there's a gentleman in Geshawa, John Bar-Levi, which means John, the son of uh, Levi. Uh, and he also, while they're getting ready to defend it, um, he asks for a Sabbath reprieve. Um, and then when, when they have the Sabbath reprieve, he and the, his zealots escape. And the people of the city readily open up to the Romans and just say, hey, come on in. Uh, we're glad to be uh, have that guy gone. 
uh, when John flees to um, Jerusalem, uh, the women and children couldn't keep up, uh, and so they're captured and either slain or uh, enslaved, so they didn't stay back to help protect them. John enters Jerusalem with his zealots, uh, and he downplays the, the loss and says instead, you know, well, we, you know, we were fighting well, but we realized it was better that we preserve our men to fight in Jerusalem and, and, and so on and so forth. And then he seeks to rise in power in Jerusalem. Uh, and he was, he was the one trying to seek to rise in power and kind of pushing back against Josephus. And now he's seeking to do that in Jerusalem. So at this time, Galilee is kind of locked up for the Romans. Um, and this is when Vespasian finds out that uh, Nero has been uh, executed. And, and this is what is during what is called the Year of the Four Emperors. So there's four, um, uh, there, when, when Nero dies, uh, there's, I'm surprised I didn't put this into a slide. There's uh, Otho, Vitellius, and uh, one other guy. But they, they, one claims to be emperor, comes in, uh, and then another claims to be emperor and comes and fights against him. When he loses, this guy commits suicide. This guy comes in, and he's now emperor. Then another guy rises up and says he's emperor, and then they fight against each other, uh, and then he loses and he dies, and then the other one comes in. And basically what happened was uh, it had returned to, uh, the news had come out to the east where Vespasian was, that uh, two of the other guys had already fallen, and the guy that had come into power was one the legions did not respect. And so the legions that were in Egypt, well, legions first that were with Vespasian in Judea, they rise up and say, you're emperor. And he's like, no, I'm not, I don't want to be emperor. And they're like, well, you're going to be emperor or we're going to kill you, mm -hmm. at least according to Josephus. Uh, he was friends with Vespasian. But um, so he, he agrees to be emperor. Uh, and then that gets found out in, in Egypt, and they're all for him. And then it gets found out in Syria, and they're all for him. And he finds out that as the news travels, everybody's for Vespasian. So he decides to go back to Rome uh, and claim this. Now, when this happens, he realizes Josephus was right. And so he frees Josephus, uh, and Josephus stays with Titus uh, in uh, that area uh, he does, I think, travel to Rome uh, um, once or twice, but he stays in uh, uh, the land of Judea. And uh, he works with Titus throughout the whole rest of the war. Um, <clears throat> but he is set free, and he is now, uh, you know, one of the friends of the emperor. Um, and so Titus now is put in charge in Israel. He puts his troops into winter quarters uh, while his father has gone to Rome, and he just starts to plan the siege to Jerusalem, but doesn't take any action. So during this time, this reprieve, uh, what's going on is all the cities of Judea are being filled with strife. So those that are in favor of war are fighting against the other Jews that are in favor of peace, even to the point of killing each other um, back and forth. The uh, <clears throat> Most are just trying to, there's a lot that are trying to gain that position of power. Um, this is when there are a number of, of people who rise up and try to say they're the Messiah, they're the Messiah. So when it says in Matthew, you know, that, you know, many will come, they will they'll claim that here's the Messiah here and here's the Messiah there. Uh, and he's like, don't listen to them and don't follow them. There were guys rising up saying, well, I'm the anointed one, I'm the Messiah, come follow me. Uh, what ended up happening is the warlike people prevailed in all those cities. They then would plunder those cities, whether you were Jew or Greek take as much as they could, and then they kind of created these robbing parties. Now, these robbers that you have, this is the word that's used for the guys that were crucified on either side of Jesus. So they weren't just a thief like they broke into somebody's house. These are political uprising uh, type of folk. So um, when this is all happening, what normally would be the case in a Roman province is the Roman uh, legions would come in and they would stop all of these uprisings. They would stop the, the crime. They would stop the things that were happening. However, because they've declared war on the Jews and this Jew fighting against Jew, they just let it go. They don't step in and police it at all. And so anarchy begins to reign in all the cities across Judea with people being killed left and right uh, quite regularly 
the richer you were, the more likely you were to be killed because then that person just took your property and claimed it as war booty kind of thing, even though it was a Jew against Jew. Uh, so the violent parties in all these different cities begin to band together uh, and they start to gain control of major cities. And then they eventually enter Jerusalem wanting to take over there, which at that point you had a high priest, you had the Sanhedrin uh, that are pushing back against them, as well as Agrippa II uh, um, tries to push against them, trying to take power as well. Um, but those that are in power realize they don't have the numbers, they don't have the strength to uh, push back against them, and so they end up having to submit to the rebels, but they remain in the city. So, in Jerusalem, then, you have John, who has come from Geshala, and the zealots that uh, were from the Galilee area and other areas coming around. Uh, and they are trying to get the entire city uh, to rise up and, and get ready for war. Uh, but the older men, they're not wanting the war, and they're fearing what's going to be done in retribution. Not so much to themselves, they're afraid it's going to be the temple being torn down and everything else. That's what they're worried about. Um, so the zealots just start taking everybody that's that's against them and either imprisoning them or killing them. Uh, and again, if you were rip more rich, you were killed quicker because they you know, basically robbed your house and used that to, to pay each other and so on and so forth. At this time, uh, Ananus, who is the biblical Annas. So in Jesus' trial, they take him first to Annas, and then they take them to Caiaphas. So uh, this Annas, uh, who was kind of highly respected within uh, Jerusalem, because uh, not only he served as high priest, but he had five sons in the course of the time of the New Testament period that served as high priest. So he's the father of five high priests and was high priest himself. Um, and so he finally stands up and gets the people to take action against the zealots. Uh, and a big part of that was because the zealots had made this kind of farce of choosing the high priest. They just said, we're just going to choose it by lot. You know, and kind of thing like God's going to choose it. Who knows how they were arguing it. And they ended up bringing a guy into the high priesthood who didn't know anything of what he was doing. He wasn't even from Jerusalem. He had grown up in Babylon. And uh, he was a total common person that... Uh, was um, something that made it a laughing stock uh, as the high priest. And this is what Annas uses to stir up the people. And they actually do take back uh, control of Jerusalem and they get the control of the outer courts of the temple. But the zealots go into the temple itself and the temple court and they shut it up and, and it's like a, a, a fortress as it is. And Annas won't fight in the court of the actual temple. He refuses to. And so they're able to remain there as a stronghold, and they make that uh, a stronghold. Um, then, this is when you have Annas uh, saying these things. This helps you kind of see what was happening. <clears throat> and Annas stood in the midst of them, and casting his eyes frequently at the temple, and having a flood of tears in his eyes, he said, Certainly it had been good for me to die before I had seen the house of God, full of so many abominations, or these sacred places that ought not to be trodden upon at random, filled with the feet of those blood-shedding villains. Uh, he, this speech is a lot longer. There's a section in between these, and then the, he says this, How then can we avoid shedding of tears when we see the Roman donations in our temple, and we will see those of our own nation taking our spoils, and plundering our glorious metropolis, and slaughtering our men, from which enormities those Romans themselves would have abstained? So the fact that you have guys in the temple courts, they, uh, and when they've been killing the people that they were against, remember these are the Sicarii, so they would wait till they would come into the temple and be on, on kind of a, their guard let down because they're worshiping, and they would, in the temple itself, come up and stab them. They had actually gone to dressing as women so that they wouldn't be as suspected. So they dressed up as women, come in to the temple courts, walk up behind somebody and kill them right in front of the temple. Hmm. This is what Josephus actually says is the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation in Daniel. Uh, and, and I think at this point he's, he's right. Now, abomination of desolation, when you look at the first destruction of the temple, so what was the abomination that led 
to the temple becoming desolate the first time. It was Manasseh filling the streets of Jerusalem with blood and filling the courts with all of the different idols and so on and so forth and defiling the temple itself to a point where the temple had to be destroyed. So how is it an abomination of desolation? It's an abomination that is so severe that it brings a desolation of the temple to be able to cleanse it. Uh, and so what you have here is this abomination that's happening right in the very temple courts, and it's going to get worse. Um, and this is, uh, this is what, in, you know, Josephus puts out, this is what dis causes the destruction of Jerusalem, the Jews themselves defiling the temple uh, to this level. So, Jerusalem, what is it like uh, at this time? You have, <clears throat> so Mount Zion, Mount Moriah, the, or the Temple Mount, there's what's called the Teropian Valley, and this is actually a pretty deep valley at the time of the first century. Today, this valley is not as deep, and it's still deep. <laughs> it's still a decent valley, um, but it's been filled up a great deal uh, since this time. Uh, the, um, the lower, well, I'll talk about that. The Hinnom Valley would go on, uh, was on the east, or sorry, the west side. This is a very deep valley as well, especially at this time. It still is. But basically attacking Jerusalem from any of these sides, with the Kidron, Kidron Valley, the Hinnom Valley, you, there was no way to get up into there uh, because you had steep 45 degree angles up to the walls for a good 100 yards or more. Mm -hmm. So if you're attacking up that, you're dead meat in that day. So the only really good way to attack was on the north side. Now, I have tried really hard to find out for sure, like, is this Mount Zion and is this Mount Moriah? Because is this Zion? Is this? There's two main hills that Jerusalem sits on. There's this one that winds, which had different uh, um, saddles in it originally. For instance, where this Antonian fortress is was clearly a separate hill than what this is on. And during Solomon's time would have been a separate hill. But Herod connected them together when he created his temple mount uh, that he had. So w what the original topography of Jerusalem was is almost unrecognizable now. You can't even, even tell. Um, most of the city streets that you see here right now are about 30 feet below what you would currently be walking on in Jerusalem because of the amount of rubble and stuff over the years that it's been conquered and, and torn down. But this Mount Zion, if you've been to Jerusalem, uh, if you went up in the um, what's called now the Tower of David, uh, it's basically in this area right here, and you know you're much higher than the Temple Mount at that point. So this is the higher mountain of the two. Uh, during Old Testament times, it was primarily just this southern part. You have here, this is the lower city, this is the upper city. I tried as best I could as you're reading in Josephus to tell what is the Acra. It may be that this was the Acra. It's hard to tell. Maybe this was a citadel, or is this the citadel? This is the Acra. It's difficult to tell because he doesn't get specific, and in his description of the city, it's, it's hard to follow uh, a little bit. But what is clear is that this area here was called the New City, uh, and, uh, and then you have the Antonian Fortress, and then you have Herod's Palace uh, with his tower, so that was a fortress, and then the Temple Mount. Uh, now, this lower city which you can't necessarily tell from, from the picture, was actually a very steep hill. And uh, if we have time next week, I'm going to just kind of take you guys on the maps thing. Maybe we'll have time tonight, but I, I don't we'll see. Uh, but take you on the maps and just let you see the steepness of these hills even today uh, in Jerusalem. Um, but uh, So this was a very steep drop. Uh, this was a more kind of an uphill from here up to, up to the, the top of the mountain. Uh, and then this wall here was the exterior wall during the time of Jesus. This outer wall was the one that was being built by uh, Agrippa, thus it was the new city. And like you see in this model, the new city was more sparsely populated, which comes into um, the choice of where the Romans end up wanting to attack it. Uh, to give you guys a sense of how much of a fortress the Temple Mount was, this is, you know, from the, oh my Tower, of Dave, um, the Tower of David Museum. Uh, and these blocks here were massive and extremely tight fit to the point that the Romans were like, there's no way we could, we could never take that out of the battering ram. There's nothing you could do uh, with that. 
Um, but you could see that if you took the Temple Mount, assailing that was going to be extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, and that's why uh, one of the parties is able to stay in the Temple Mount for so long without being, being dislodged. So what happens at this point, let me get to the... <coughs> so after um, uh, Ananus stirs up the people against uh, um, uh, the zealots, the zealots are able to take back the Temple Mount, and they are in the Temple Mount. And then Ananus is, uh, or Annas is outside, and he and the Sanhedrin and such now have more control of uh, those in the city. At this point, the zealots send down to Edomia. Uh, Edomia is, you know, where Herod was from. They had been forced to be converted into Jews, and they say to the Edomians hey, Annas and the leaders here are getting ready to surrender the temple in Jerusalem to Rome. And the Edomians didn't want them uh, to do that. And so the Edomians come up um, to, you know, defend the temple and, uh, and such. And Ananas tries to talk with them and say, you know, no, it's not what we're trying to do. We have these zealots who are defiling the temple. And, uh, and so we want you to... You know, would you guys come in and basically help us uh, with that? The Edomians uh, at first um, don't agree to terms with Annas and such, and so they're stuck outside the wall, and this great storm breaks out, uh, and it was a huge thunderstorm that was uncharacteristic of that time. And so the moderates that are with uh, Ananas see it as, you know, this is God being against the Edomians because they're, they're not helping us and, and they have the wrong reasons for being here. Uh, but the zealots use the storm as uh, the sound and the fact that everyone's sheltering as a way to open the gates and let the Edomians in. So the Edomians come into the city of Jerusalem, and they pretty much just rampage throughout the entire city uh, and take control of the city, uh, except for the, the Temple Mount. And they put to death uh, Annas, the high priest, and uh, many of the other uh, leaders uh, at that time. And so the strong, moderate leaders now are gone out of the city. Um, but then they also realize and find out that John was not telling the truth about their desire to surrender to uh, the Romans and such like that. And so out of protest, they leave Jerusalem and pretty much leave it in John's hands. Now, when this happens, John is now left in control of Jerusalem. So he's there with his zealots. And they start systematically murdering all of their opponents. Uh, this is the, the, where the cross-dressing assassins really comes into play. And uh, a lot of the um, people attempt to flee to the Romans uh, <coughs> and, and ask for protection. But they're basically standing at the gates and you can't leave unless you get questioned. And, and they're letting some of the poorest of the poor leave Jerusalem, but they won't let anyone else out. And many of them, they're just killing, especially, again, if you were rich. Now, something that's really sad throughout this whole time, and it, 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 um, when exactly it starts uh, and such, uh, it's, I can't quite remember. But this practice of the, the zealots uh, kind of fleecing you for whatever they could on your way out of Jerusalem if you're trying to get out, uh, started a practice of the Jews that when they would leave Jerusalem, they would take all their gold and they would swallow it. And then as they got out of Jerusalem, they would, you know, let it pass through and then get their gold back. This got out to the various forces that were surrounding Jerusalem eventually when Rome comes into play, uh, that this was the practice that they were doing. And it ended up being their doom because throughout the whole siege of Jerusalem, when people would get out of the city, the other people would be like, yeah, we'll receive you. And they'd actually take them captive and then kill them and then cut them open to try to find their gold. Uh, and so even the people that try to escape throughout the siege of Jerusalem, if you even do get out and you do escape, you often didn't survive because there were many other things uh, that were going on. <clears throat> so uh, zealots uh, are killing all who attempt uh, to leave. Uh, and... They intentionally are leaving, when they kill these people, they're leaving their bodies unburned and, and unburied uh, so that they can disgrace those 
because uh, burial was a very important thing. Now, eventually, there's so many dead that they fill all the upper rooms of the homes in Jerusalem. And uh, they're just stacked like cordwood all throughout the homes. And they eventually get so much, uh, you'll, we're going to see that they're, they were pouring thousands of bodies over the wall a day uh, in the siege. So uh, it's at this point, while Simon is, or while John is in control and they're, and they're uh, ravaging Jerusalem, that this man named Simon, who was with the Edomians that had come up to uh, Jerusalem that first time, uh, but he went out to Masada, and at the beginning of all this conflict, a group of zealots had taken control of Masada. He went and kind of joined them, but then also took control of the zealots that were at Masada. And then once he got strong enough, he actually went and took control of all of Idumea uh, as well. So he has now a large army with him because the Idumeans surrendered and many of them agreed to fight uh, with him. And then he then goes and marches on Jerusalem because he wants to take control of Jerusalem. So now you have Simon with his uh, army outside of Jerusalem, John with his forces controlling Jerusalem, and Rome over in Caesarea just twiddling their thumbs, letting the Jews destroy themselves before they had to go and do a siege. And what ends up happening then uh, is the populace is so upset with John uh, that they want Simon uh, to come in and to take the city back from John. And while they're going through that negotiation, John, in order to get at Simon, because they aren't defeating him in open battle, they don't want to leave the Temple Mount and their stronghold, uh, they instead have somebody that goes out and they kidnap Simon's wife uh, and take her captive. And then Simon basically says, you give me my wife back or I'm going to tear the walls of Jerusalem down. And they can't afford to have the walls torn down because the Roman army uh, is now coming. Uh, and so uh, eventually they let him in, thinking that he's going to get rid of John. Uh, and instead, Simon comes in, takes control, uh, and has and has no esteem for the people that invited him in. And, and he goes about killing people just like John was killing people. And there's almost no difference uh, between the two. So uh, at this point... Uh, Vespasian has become emperor, and, uh, and Titus is getting ready to bring his army. The new season is starting. It's spring, and also with spring comes the Passover. And so when, uh, um, a little bit before the Passover, Eliezer, who was uh, originally the person, like when all of this started, his job was kind of the steward of the temple. He was he was the person over the building and, and, and such like that. Uh, and Eliezer does not like some of the things that John is doing, so he rebels against John. And so now you've got Eliezer, who's in the actual temple itself as a fortress, John, who's in the area around it, and then Simon, who's out in the city, and they're all shooting at each other, killing each other, uh, and everything else like that. And so what you have is... Uh, um, John, who was being fired on from both sides, which probably wasn't pleasant, uh, and uh, Simon pretty comfortably uh, out in the city. Hmm. Now, during this time, uh, um, uh, John was probably more headquartered in the Antonian Fortress, which we'll talk a little bit more uh, about later. Uh, and uh, Simon is fortress more in Herod's palace up here. And the city is kind of left to the people that are stuck in the city and cannot uh, get out. <coughs> Rome uh, is letting this, this happen, letting the conditions uh, continue. But then Titus arrives, and at first the three factions kind of work together uh, um, to try to go out and attack the Romans, but they end up not being able to, to actually come to a true unity. Um, and they go back to, to fighting each other. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the area then between the temple and the rest of the city, this becomes like a no man zone, the dead zone, like what you had in World War I in that area. It's just, it's, it's all burned. Uh, they've set fire to a lot of those places. Uh, they've cleared it as best they can so no one can attack the temple and, and such. Now it's at this time 
that uh, Passover arrives, and Eliezer, um, being pious, uh, uh, he opens the doors to the temple to allow the worshipers to come in uh, mm -hmm. at Passover. However, John and his men, they just cover their armor and their swords with robes, and they walk in, and they fight a battle, Jew against Jew, in the very court of the temple, uh, killing each other there. Eliezer surrenders to stop that from continuing. John once again takes control um, of the temple, uh, and uh, now it's, it's kind of pandemonium, and, and they feel free to do uh, a bunch of things that are horrible. Also, because it's Passover, the whole city, and this goes to show you, people were still coming to worship, still coming to do Passover, even though these attacks were happening. The city fills with all of the people coming from around the empire for Passover, and when it is at its fullest, that is when you have <coughs> Titus show up. So this gives, you, this gives you an idea of how steep that city was, the lower city. This is all the upper city. The red roofs are all upper city. This is all lower city. John is in the temple, Eli or Eli's temple. John is on the Temple Mount in the Antonio Fortress. And in between, you have this, this dead zone. <laughs> Eliezer was in the temple. But this shows you as well how much the temple itself was like a fortress. Uh, and then you had John, who was in the surrounding area, and then Simon uh, out in the, in the city with his main fortress being the towers that you see uh, in the background. And this is when then the Romans come in. So the city is bursting at the seams with people. The, um, <clears throat> the grain supplies, however, because Eliezer, John, and Simon have been fighting against each other, one of the things they've done is attacked each other's food supplies, which means that they destroyed a lot of the food that was saved up for the long siege. And now you have Passover numbers that were in the city, uh, which, is, which is over a million people at this point mm -hmm. that are in this uh, city during the siege. Now, when the Romans come, they do kind of surround it, but they have main camps. Um, the one There's a camp that was up here that you'll see on, on future maps, but the main camp that they had would be off the screen uh, north of the city. This was kind of a neat image that I found that they mm. somebody had made. So this would be from one of those. Um, so from this tower right here, so you'll see this tower on one side and this tower on the other side. But if you were in that tower looking north, it would have looked something like this with the Romans up on Mount Scopus with a view of the city uh, being able to see it. And uh, uh, they um, <clears throat> basically, the whole city became afraid at this point because the Romans, when they came, they, they didn't just like arrive as an army. They built their own little cities all around. They had walls, they had moats, they had everything. And so they were able to sit there and watch the Romans build that and realize they were in trouble. The view of Jerusalem from Mount Scopus, that's the Temple Mount, if you can see there. This is a picture I took uh, when I was there. But you can see how you're up above and you can see the city. Uh, maybe there was less smog uh, at that day. We don't know. So the Romans are camped. Uh, he begins the siege. So Titus first... Um, rides around the walls and tries to determine the best place for the assault. But while he's, uh, um, he's looking at the original wall, the old city was basically determined unassailable. So everything here is unassailable. And, they, and in fact, never through the siege did they even try uh, to take it down. Hmm. Um, there was a place in the third wall that was lower so it's going to be right about here because that's where Cestius tore it down and they hadn't had time to repair it as well. And so it was a weaker spot uh, in the wall. And the second wall did not connect here as well, giving access uh, to the first wall. So here, you'll see that the second wall comes and stops here. The third wall connects here. So if they got through this, then they might be able to get in through the first wall uh, if they needed to. Um, this right here, by the way, is where Golgotha is, where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where the crucifixion occurred and the burial of Christ. That was right here, which was at that time, uh, uh, at the Christ time, outside the city at this time, inside uh, the city. Um, now, 
Nicanor, who is a friend of Titus, he's also the one that had spoken to Josephus uh, and tried to convince Josephus to surrender himself. Uh, Nicanor is wounded by an arrow when he approached the wall to speak to the people. So both Nicanor and Josephus went to the, to the wall and in Hebrew were trying to persuade the people to terms of peace. And they said the Romans will leave the city alone. They're not going to destroy the temple. And you know, if, you, if you do this, you just have to come out and they'll, we'll, they'll listen to our desires for you know, who would be governor. Because now you have an entirely new emperor who would, who would uh, honor those things. Uh, but the Jews inside just heaved reproaches at them and uh, were throwing things uh, at them. Uh, and one even shoots an arrow and hits uh, Nicanor, and Titus just, is just like, they don't want any peace, so I'm going to press the siege right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Romans, uh, they order, he orders the trees around Jerusalem to be cut. Now, when you go to Israel today, you're going to find that there's not a lot of trees, and there's a lot of bare land. Part of that is, it's not just this siege. Jerusalem and Israel has been attacked over and over and over and over and over again. And enough of that happening, you denude the whole area because you tore out all the trees. And they actually, the Romans, run out of trees. <laughs> Let's put it that way. They run out of trees to cut down to build their fortifications around uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and that's for you know a good number of miles all around the cities. That tells you how much they're cutting down. And they build a uh, kind of a wall or uh, all around, an earthen wall, uh, and a moat, and then everything between the wall that they've built and the wall of Jerusalem, they level. So if it's a house, they burn it down, they level it. Everything between their wall and, and the wall of Jerusalem is gone. And then that way they can see enemies coming and vice versa. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> at this time, uh, the suburbs around Jerusalem so are all burned down. So all the houses that are outside the wall, gone. <laughs> Titus <coughs> then seeks to take uh, the new city. And uh, he attacks at that weak spot in the wall and succeeds in, uh, in get, taking it down. But when they get into the new city, it's uninhabited. So the Jews knew that it was going to come down quick. So they all pulled back within the old wall uh, and the, the Romans are able to come into the new city quite easily and set up camp right in uh, the new city. Uh, if you go to Jerusalem today and you're up on the Tower of David, this the Jaffa Gate is in between where this picture is being taken in that wall is the Jaffa Gate, which is <coughs> kind of the main entrance into old Jerusalem today. Uh, and this wall area right here was where the Romans would have come in. Different wall. This was a wall built by uh, Crusaders and then by Saladin. Uh, but... Um, but it's, that's the area that that would have happened. This I just put in because you don't always realize just how you know, horrific the battles were and all of what was going on. So they are now in the uh, new city and they decide to attack the, uh, the second wall. Um, so you have them attack the second wall uh, they set up siege engines all around. And these siege engines uh, are really something else. They actually had a giant uh, iron ram's head on the big pole that they would be swinging back and forth. And throughout this whole siege, uh, it's a very difficult siege for the Romans to do. There are many times that the Romans get discouraged and they think they're not going to succeed. Uh, the Jews were going out, starting all their siege engines on fire and, and burning them. And they're... And, what it comes down to is the Jews were so zealous they would do absolutely crazy things. Uh, and just the fact that they're doing those crazy, crazy things made the Romans afraid because you don't know what they're, you know, they're going to try. And there's a great many valiant acts, you would say, that the Jews did in, in fighting um, and, and scared them. And it was very hard for the Romans to keep their siege works up. Uh, but they do eventually uh, persevere in that. Um, <clears throat> the Roman war engines <clears throat> that they're using on the wall, the second wall, which is more established, uh, have little effect uh, at first, uh, and not a lot is happening. And uh, basically the Jews inside are just like, yeah, we're, we're fine. We don't have to um, worry about it. 
Um, then, <clears throat> after a constant uh, um, combination of battering it and then also mining, if you guys, they would dig under the wall and try to dislodge things, uh, eventually uh, a por this portion of the second wall begins to fall and they break through. Uh, <clears throat> Titus at first chooses not to enlarge the breach in the wall, uh, partly because he wants to sue for peace. He's like, because you know, the more you tear down on the wall and, and the more they have to build up, so he's like, hey, you want to preserve your wall. So he tries once more to sue for peace. None of that uh, happens again. Uh, but the Jews feigned surrender at this time, but instead tried to attack uh, the uh, engines that they had. Um, and so eventually the Romans, when they, um, when they do right that, real quick here, just to just say this, this thing of the Jews feigning um, surrender, both on small groups, individuals, and everything, they do it as a trick so often that when the genuine people are trying to surrender, they get killed. And so, uh, and Josephus kind of brings it up as, in a way as to say, you know, everything that they try to do just ensures that God's wrath is filled to its fullest. Because no matter what, no one's escaping uh, from the city. Very, very few escape from the city. Um, <clears throat> so they don't enlarge the hole. They, he commands, Titus commands that no one uh, else is to be killed. And then he's hoping that this is going to bring surrender. He's like, look, see, we broke through your wall, and so on and so forth. However, the Jews read this kindness as weakness. They thought, oh, see, he's trying to give up already. Uh, and so uh, they end up trying to drive the Romans, Romans out. Uh, but the Romans go in and attack, and it's just brutal street-to-street, hand-to-hand fighting all throughout this section of the city. Uh, and, and they're taking block by block. It's not a, it's not a quick thing here at all. Um, and at one point, the, Jew, the Romans even get pushed back out of the wall, then they push their way back in, and now they're starting to um, uh, burn the city and tear down the wall because Titus is like, forget it, I'm not going to be merciful anymore. So then... <clears throat> Titus prepares uh, for the final siege of the old wall in the, in the temple. Um, and he gives a four-day reprieve. He lines all the legions up before the wall in full regalia, hoping that they're going to see just how badly they have it. So outside and all around, the whole city is surrounded by all these. Now, the reason he brought them all together, it was payday. So he's going out and he's paying all of them. And giving them awards so the guys are all dressed up and, and everything. And uh, um, the Jews, you know, many of them are scared to death inside. The, the citizens are all wanting to flee, but the zealots won't let them. Uh, and they're doing what they can to kind of keep morale up, having to stare at this massive army. And so when they're doing done with that, the hopes of suing for peace do not come to fruition. Uh, and uh, they don't want anything to do with peace, so Titus prepares to do the attack on the final uh, and remaining wall. Uh, now, during the first part of all of this, you'll remember the Jews had captured all of these weapons from Cestius when he had first come and surrounded Jerusalem and left, and they attacked him, and they had all these weapons. And the Jews, through this whole time, were using those weapons, but not very good. They, didn't, they weren't experienced. They didn't know how to use them. Um, but what ends up happening is there are some... Uh, there are a few that were trained on how to do them and they've been training them and then with all the experience they've had, now they've gotten good at it. So at this point in the siege, the Jews are much better with the weapons that they've captured and they still have a good amount of supply uh, of, of the <coughs> we could say ammunition for these weapons. Um, <clears throat> and so um, they, they begin to fight you know, more voraciously uh, at this time, as it comes to these last walls. Uh, and uh, so as they are doing this, Titus, one more time, uh, sends Josephus to give an offer of peace. Uh, the seditious mock him on the walls, uh, and uh, they're making fun of him, and then Josephus condemns them. The speech that Josephus gives in condemning them is the one where um, you see him outlining 
how many abominations they've done and what they uh, what has been accomplished uh, in the city, uh, and so that and that's uh, kind of informative uh, theologically for us when we talk about you know the abomination of desolation and such like that. But in this speech, he reminds them uh, that if they are righteous, um, God would be fighting on their side. He reminds them. <coughs> that uh, the times that God allowed their defeat because of unrighteousness. So he goes through the history of Israel, talks about the fall of Babylon, talks about Manasseh and what he did and all these different things. Uh, he then points to the acts of unrighteousness that they're doing, condemning them. Now, while he's standing here and doing all of this, his own wife and children are in the city at the mercy of the zealots. Uh, and he reminds them, he's like, he's like, I know what I am risking in doing this. Uh, and uh, but he's pleading with them to surrender, um, and uh, when uh, this happens, <clears throat> and they refuse to listen and they mock Josephus, Titus is absolutely done with all of it, and he's like, anyone who gets out now, they crucify them in front of the um, in front of the city uh, as a punishment. And so there's a commentator, thank you, there's a commentator um, in the Josephus, a Christian commentator that points to this, you know, kind of the, the justness of, you know, those that had crucified Christ being crucified outside the city um, after having rejected their Messiah. Um, at this point then, with the second wall, they are, they're, they're attempting um, to go against the Antonian fortress uh, yeah, because it's one of the main things they need to be able to take. And when they first start bombarding the Antonian fortress, they don't make any progress at all. Um, part of that is because of what this Antonian fortress was. Now, this is one of the better pictures um, I've seen of the Antonian fortress that have been made. A lot of them, they show the different things. When you read in Josephus the description, the height of the towers and what it's built upon um, is most accurate in this. There was the one tower that was much taller than the others. Uh, so this was the, the shorter, shorter, and then a little bit taller, and then much taller. Uh, he refers to the inside as being palatial and almost like a city um, that you know, a good number of people could live within and do fine that even had like shops and things like that um, within it. And uh, so John, who has control of the temple, would have mostly been inside um, this fortress. Now, here's a picture of it <clears throat> in a model, in which you can't, I don't know how well you guys can see it, but if you look here, you'll notice that it's not stone like this. If you got up closer, you, it looks like rock. And that's because they had cut into the hill that the fortress was built upon to expand the, the Temple Mount. And this fortress, this isn't stone that they put, this is solid bedrock. Uh, and the same thing is going to be true on the other side of the fortress. If you would look here, you can tell this is a different material. It's like just solid bedrock. And so there's no way that the Romans can come up and across the moat get these things going that's going to do anything to that solid bedrock. Uh, so they have to go on the sides here where they didn't have the bedrock and it came down because uh, that was the, the crown of a hill um, that that was built upon. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you, David. You're welcome. And so, when they first start, <laughs> they, they actually bang away at the one tower, and they dislodge one of the stones, and they pull it out, and it does nothing. <laughs> and the Romans just start to despair. I mean, some of them are just so frustrated. And so, what he decides to do, since it's, it's you know... Um, He's, he, he's going to say, well, I'm just going to put a wall around this and absolutely starve them out because people are escaping and getting out and bringing food in and things like that, and, and we have to you know, take care of that. Now, interestingly, during this time, you know, there are a lot of people kind of getting in and out of the city. They're actually pretty successful at stealing the Romans' horses because some of the Roman servants were taking the horses out to pasture and then just leaving them and you know, coming back later to get them. But the Jews would go out and, and snag them. Uh, that person was punished, that the one of the, that got caught, uh, and then the Romans became the wiser. The other thing is there's a number of underground passages from inside the city to outside the city 
um, that are being taken. And so when he puts up this wall, he actually puts it far enough out that they're coming up still within the wall. They're not able to dig under and get past um, that. And, uh, and so now they really start to starve. Um, some of the people are so hungry, they still go outside the walls to go and pick herbs and try to pick something that they can eat, figuring <coughs> whichever. And this is when some of the forces um, start to capture them and gut them for the gold and see if they found which which they couldn't. When now when when Titus finds out that they're doing that practice of gutting the people looking for the gold, he goes to the commanders of those army and says that has to stop. He's like that's too insane. That's too uh, I'm trying to uncivilized. Uh, but uh, the practice continued just in secret uh, after that. They were more careful uh, about it. Um, but they do start to now kind of starve out. But Titus is always, and it's interesting what, what, he's, what he says, because there's, there's a, um, uh, um, a sense of where he's, he could have, right, just from the beginning, surrounded Jerusalem and starved him out. That was actually one of the things that was suggested to him. He was worried about the glory of it. He thought it would make Rome look weak. He thought that he wouldn't get as much glory from that as a triumph, that it would take too long, people would lose interest, da, 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 da. And you can see his pursuit of glory cost the Romans dearly, um, and, uh, um, and, it, and it ended up being a much more difficult battle. Mm -hmm. But here, they start to starve them out. People are starving, and here they're starving now at a rate... Um, <coughs> um, let's see if I have it here. Yeah, the um, they're they're starting to read where they're the this is when they're having to throw the bodies over the wall. They're, they they can't bury them. They can't figure out what to do with them, and so they're just taking the bodies and throwing them over the walls. Now, one of the places that they throw them out and over the walls and pile up is out in this valley, which was similar to what happened during the time of Babylon. And this valley right here is called the Hinnom Valley. Have any of you guys heard of the Hinnom Valley? Okay. Mm -hmm. What other word in, uh, do we find in the Bible that comes from the Valley of the Sons of Ben-Hinnom? Or the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, which is the Sons of Hinnom. So the, I'll give you a hint. The word for valley is gay. So gay Ben-Hinnom shortens to, do you know? Gehenna. Gehenna. Hell. So the picture that is developed within Hebrew thought of hell, the place of punishment, is the burning of the bodies in this valley uh, as a course of God's judgment uh, against the Jews. And that becomes the picture that they use for what is the eternal uh, end uh, uh, where that will happen. So, um, so they're throwing bodies over the wall uh, here. Uh, and I think... I think there's one point where it almost reaches 10,000 a day. And this is when, this is when uh, Titus is like, his soldiers having to watch this was so horrific that he's like, we need to just um, finish this. So they finally go full force. He brings at this point now, um, and I don't know why he didn't do this earlier, but he brings all of his legions all at once to the wall. He doesn't like bring certain units to attack and try to do stuff. He brings them all, and they succeed finally in taking down the the towers of the Antonian fortress. Um, <clears throat> and part of the thing is, up to this point, there was still a a fear of the god that was this, in this temple of attacking something so close to the temple that there were some things they weren't doing. Uh, and they weren't using fire out of a fear that it would burn the temple down. Now they're using fire, and they don't care uh, about that. Um, however, once this portion starts and they start using fire, both sides start using fire against each other in different ways. Uh, one, one trick the Jews did when they got into the Antonian fortress and had access to the temple, uh, they actually uh, created a fire trap on top of one of the buildings, and then created a commotion that caused the Romans to try to attack them on top of the building, and they all ran off and then lit it on fire, and all the Romans on there were dying. Um, and uh, it was, yeah, it was a really sad, detailed thing that uh, Josephus goes into, the 
acts of one of the men as, as that's happening. Um, but you see them using it. Well, that fire begins to spread and is a big part of how the temple burns down. Now, when you see these pictures of the temple, um, they really don't do... I'm trying to think here if... Um, I thought I had it in the PowerPoint, but... Um, <clears throat> I have pictures. I'll show them. I'll show you at the end. Say uh, if I didn't put them in the PowerPoint. Um, but <clears throat> inside this Temple Mount was far more buildings than what you see in all the models. That uh, the way Josephus describes it, this entire area of pavement here would have been buildings and pat covered patios and, and porticos and everything like that. It, it would. It was a lot of structures. Um, within this, it wasn't just this open stone um, uh, platform for the whole thing. And so the fires that are happening and stuff are happening in those cloisters that are around uh, the temple. So once they take the Antonian fortress, they do come into the temple. And when they fight in the temple, it is hand to hand and it is vicious. Uh, they're fighting at night now. Um, there's times where you, they can't... The, um, the Romans aren't killing each other because they're standing so close in a particular unit and how they're supposed to fight. The Jews, however, because they're just kind of coming in haphazard, they misidentify each other and they're actually killing each other. Uh, and they go through and more and more of it's burning. This is taking more than a day to take the Temple Mount. I'll just put it that way. And then uh, at one point, uh, because the different parts of the cloisters are burning, uh, there is a Roman soldier who grabs a... A uh, piece of burning wood and throws it up and through the window of the temple itself and that is when the temple starts to burn uh, it takes long enough to burn that they realize it's burning and Titus still has time to go in and do a tour of the temple before it burns down so that kind of gives you uh, an idea um, John who was leading this group at this point he goes underground uh, He's, it's it's hard to tell uh, when I was reading through if he goes underground now or if he's still part of the negotiations um, after the Temple Mount is taken. Uh, and so it's kind of a little bit of both ways, you know, here on the slides and in the notes. I, I included John with the negotiations with Simon, but it's not really clear in, in Josephus. But we do know that John, in defeat, goes underground into the caves and stuff below um, Jerusalem. <clears throat> At this point, then, once the Temple Mount uh, is taken, um, let me see here, make <coughs> sure I'm not missing something. Um, they have one last time where they sue for peace. Uh, and they, so they stand at this gate, Josephus translates, Titus comes out and says, you guys can all surrender now, we'll leave the rest of the city, there'll be something to, to be rebuilt. You can see that the temple's already burned, there's nothing to keep us from burning the rest of the city. You guys need to surrender, and you need to surrender unconditionally. Um, actually, what we say, I, I missed something before with the burning of the temple. Um, the uh, um, the morning when when the temple started to burn, what uh, um, the what Josephus says is that the the cry around Jerusalem and the countryside was just <laughs> horrific. So you can imagine, he said, even the people who were so parched from famine and had had almost no water just moan, they used the last of their strength to moan, and the whole moaning of the city was, was going about. And he said, and, and, and Perea echoed it. Now, Perea is the hills on the other side of the Jordan River. And one commentator was like, well, there's no way that you know, they could be echoing. But if you've been to Israel, you'll know that you can stand at Jericho and see the uh, um, top of the... Um, <coughs> Mount of Olives, which means you would have seen the glow of the burning city of Jerusalem. If you were over in Perea on the other side, up on the hills, you would have been able to look out. You'd have seen Jerusalem burning. It's not that far away that you can't see it. And all the hills around Judea are, are hearing it. And there's this cry going up that he describes as coming not just from the city, but everywhere, where everyone is, is mourning. Um, and I, I bring that up, you know, two reasons. One, to just realize how terrible this was for all the Jews to see their beautiful temple and city honestly being burnt and destroyed. Um, but also when it says that and all the tribes, there's a verse, all the tribes of the earth will mourn, but that word earth can all be all the tribes of the land will mourn. 
and it can be referring to uh, you know something to this uh, effect. And I bring that up just because that's an option of how to understand that phrase uh, in that verse. Can't remember where the verse is though, so we'll have to bring that up maybe next week. You guys remind me. Um, so there's this morning when the temple is destroyed. Titus goes out and he treats with the, the zealots, uh, Simon and John, if John is still with him, demands an unconditional surrender. Uh, and they instead demand back that they should be allowed to flee into the wilderness. And Titus is like, you're past demands uh, at this point. Uh, and so he just sends his troop into the rest of the city uh, to destroy it. Uh, and and basically burn it to the ground. Uh, Simon uh, retreats uh, into Herod's fortress, um, and uh, when Titus comes and looks at Herod's fortress, he's like, "Oh, we're up a creek because we can't take this down." Uh, but for some reason, uh, all the guys Simon they snuck out at night. Everyone that was with him in the towers, uh, and they went into the caverns under Jerusalem like John did. Uh, and they just found the fortress open, and Titus, you know, I mean, Titus actually says to Josephus, you know, if anything shows that your God has opened this up to us, is that this tower was just left to us, because I don't know how we would have taken this. Uh, and so, um, <clears throat> so Simon then eventually goes into those caverns. Now, the Roman, Simon and John eventually come up out of those caverns, because they run out of food, uh, Simon is really interesting because when he comes up out of the caverns, he dresses himself in a white robe with this purple sash, it's not like anybody, uh, and comes out and surrenders himself. Now John of Geshala, he, when he's taken captive, he was taken captive first, and he is uh, sent away to a lifetime of basically hard labor in the mines of, um, uh, and doing horrible slavery for the rest of his life. Uh, Simon is the one who was taken captive and led at the end of the triumph. And so Simon dies uh, thanks to the beast in the Colosseum uh, because when he is taken back to Rome, they lead the triumph, they get up to the top, and uh, when everybody you know cheers and stuff, then a signal is sent out, and then Simon is killed in the Colosseum, uh, and then they get a signal back that he's dead, and then they celebrate. So that's what Simon's role was uh, in the end. <clears throat> and so, Then, what I just have here is just some of the signs that Josephus talks about um, that were happening <coughs> at this time. This is a painting, one of the famous um, paintings of the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, but it says, these signs, were, some of them were recorded by Josephus and Tacitus. So Josephus, who is Jewish, wrote uh, first as an eyewitness. Tacitus uh, was a Roman and he wrote later. Um, and, but eyewitnesses would have still been alive when Tacitus wrote, so it's, it's, you know, it's not like he's so far away that he um, couldn't fact check it. So during this, uh, the festivals of AD 66, the Jewish festivals, there was a star over Jerusalem that was shaped like a sword or a cross. It basically had a long tail on it. Now, one of the interesting things with that, uh, it's in, it, it also refers to a comet. And it's hard from the way the Greek is to say, is it is the star and the comet the same thing? Uh, or are they separate things? Um, but most believe they're separate things. Um, but this idea of the star with the sword uh, is actually, you know, taken to be as like the sign we were here at Christmas time. And what was the sign of Jesus coming the first time? Star. And then so when it says in Matthew 24, uh, you know, that the sign of the Son of Man would be in the skies, and then you see this star uh, in the skies again, uh, right before all of the war with Rome started, uh, that that, could that be a fulfillment of that? Um, the uh, comet is actually something that has been even confirmed, you know, scientifically that they've gone back and uh, affirmed that there was a comet at this time. Um, Halley's Comet actually was around this time, I don't remember if that's one in 66 or the one in 62. Also, during the Passover, <coughs> as the war was beginning with Rome, there was a great light that shone in the temple for a half an hour during the Passover. Uh, it was so bright, they said it was like daytime. 
and uh, and then the door to the inner court of the temple was found open. It takes twenty men to open it, and they have no idea who opened it. Hmm. And uh, <clears throat> and they also found uh, had a time um, when angelic chariots were seen in the clouds uh, immediately following the Passover, uh, and then an earthquake during Pentecost uh, occurred with a great voice saying, let us depart, coming from the temple. Uh, and one of those was accompanied by a large trumpet sound. I think it was the, when it says a great voice, um, that the other earthquake and this loud trumpet and then the, these voices like a multitude coming from uh, the temple saying, let us depart. And what Josephus says is he said, when he gets done with the whole destruction of Jerusalem, he's like, you know, you know, seeing now what followed these signs, you look back on the signs and realize these were signs clearly um, pointing to the destruction uh, that was coming. Um, and then that last paragraph is just something that should have been deleted, and I don't know why it's still there. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, that was supposed to be deleted and, and moved, but you can cross that out. So that is the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple. Next week we're going to be coming, covering what happened after that, the final the finishing up of the war, some of the implications of the war, uh, prophecy-wise and such like that, and then what happened to the Jewish nation to up to the Bar Kokhba revolt, which was the final nail in the coffin for the Jewish nation existing as a country for thousands of years. So, uh, what questions do you guys have? How many soldiers was there for the Roman ar army at that time, you think, to, to conquer them? There was about, um, from what we know, 60,000, and that would have varied in and out with the troops coming in and out, uh, but about 60,000 soldiers, and there was about, um, I think probably in the end with all the other countries, though, that ended up joining, um, I, think, I think it probably would have been closer to 100,000. But the um, one, one other thing, I forgot to say is that you know they, they captured all the, the Jews and they had been you know throughout the war been capturing Jews and so much gold came out of this for the Romans that the you know the value of gold dropped in Damascus and Antioch significantly. Uh, the slaves were so plentiful um, that you also were having a hard time getting a good price for a slave. And what's interesting about that is how the Song of Moses ends. The Song of Moses in Deuteronomy goes through the entire history of Israel, and it ends with this note of, you know, you'll go to be sold into slavery and no one will even want you. Hmm. And that's how the Song of Moses ends. And you're like, what in the world? But you get to the end of this fight with Jerusalem, and they there's so many plentiful slaves they can't even sell them. Uh, and what, and that's <clears throat> part of what leads me to see you, know, you have the first covenant with Israel and God did that whole plan but this is the end of that plan with Israel as a political entity a political nation uh, with a you know the uh, what we ex would, would think of that and that's where it differs from dispensationalism where dispensationalism will will say no you know political you know Political Israel has been paused, and after the rapture and the seven-year tribulation, political Israel will be picked back up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, that's why um, in 1950, when the modern state of Israel came to be, dispensationalism went from a kind of side theology uh, that wasn't very common to one of the most common theologies in America, um, because that, that establishment of the modern state of Israel uh, really seem to be like that's the proof that, that this is, you know, the case. Um, and so um, when you see the division between dispensationalism and, and covenant theology, which um, some of you may know, some of you may not, but when you see that division, that creation of the modern state of Israel actually had a huge impact on that division within the church. Uh, and it still is kind of one of those interesting hot topics that you can talk I got one more question. Uh -huh. uh, 
What is you? What, what is your reasoning why why people, the, you know, the Gentiles and that hate the Jews so much? There's a lot of different reasonings about why they're hated as a people so much. Uh, I think it was because they're because of their disobedience, like where they talk about in Ezekiel, that they were scattered and that they were going to be hated. I think because of their sin against God. So the, the you know. I'll actually remember to repeat it for the people on the video. The, the question is how how and why so many people hated the Jews. Kind of why is there anti-Semitism even today? Um, even today. Now, <clears throat> in the in the time that we're talking about here, the anti-Semitism was because of the privileges that the Jews received um, at the hands of the Romans and the Greeks. They were given great religious privileges that others did not have. Um, and you know when uh, you know if. If your neighbor is Jewish and every seven years he doesn't have to pay taxes, but you do, that, that bugs you. Um, and so there's a lot of things like that. That uh, And then not only did they do that, but then the Jews themselves were like, you can't even enter our house. You're unclean. You know, we can't eat with you because you're unclean. I can't do this with you because you're, I mean, constantly telling you you're unclean. And, and you're like, okay. I mean, so there were a lot of things to have the Gentiles really, you know, uh, dislike the Jews. Uh, in that day, um, let me finish real quick, and I'll take yours. In modern day, um, <coughs> modern day Europe, especially, a lot of the anti-Semitism came out of two key things. One, because the the theology of you know they killed the Messiah, uh, they killed Christ. Two, is because the um, the practice of the Roman Catholic Church was that Christians could not lend to Christians with interest or usury. And so you could lend, but you couldn't make money off of it. So the only place you could ever borrow from were Jews who would charge you interest. And because of that, the Jews became very much integrated within the financial systems within Europe and very wealthy and typically seen as being done at the cost of Christians. Um, and then they were seen to be in all these positions of power and everything else like that. And that created a lot of the anti-Semitism that... Um, Hitler was able to grab onto and fan into flame, accusing them of being in the positions of power and being fascist, or not fascist, being a communist and, and all this other stuff. So um, <clears throat> the modern and uh, anti-Semitism uh, had a little bit different uh, motives behind it or reasons for it. That's what I was going to say about <clears throat> that God still blesses them financially and he still, like, there's they're in Hollywood and they're their um bankers and they also won nobel peace prizes for their scientific discoveries so he's still blessing them through that kind of way yeah but he, he always has been keeping his promises to them and you know what's interesting about that is the understanding that god is keeping that promise regardless of the obedience mm -hmm. like and that shows his love to the thousandth generation because we have not exhausted a thousand generations since abraham and he's, he's saying, you know, when he says to, you know, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated it. But he says, Jacob, the only reason you still exist is because I love your father, Jacob. It's not because of what you're doing right now. Uh, and uh, for us to kind of realize that it's that promise of God is so faithful that even with all of their disobedience, that blessing is going to be there because he promised it. Period. For us as Christians, the caution is, I would say, especially in today's current environment is to then look at modern Israel as can't do any wrong. That's part of the struggle I have, is that we've, we've gotten to a point of supporting Israel against <clears throat> against Palestinians without a realization some of those Palestinians are Christian brothers and sisters and there's some things that Israel are doing that isn't okay but because you know God bless them, it's, it's almost like because God bless them, like they're just they're just great, and whatever they're doing, we just automatically side with them, and, and we're just right there behind them. Um, we should, for sure, support Israel because God blesses those who bless them, and He curses those who curse them, and that is still standing, and that's still the case. Um, but at the same time, to also consider what they're doing and realize they're not this perfect people that don't that do everything justly and rightly. Um, and not automatically side with one. And the same thing can be said about Palestinians. And everything. I, I, I'm not, I have no strong view one way or the other. It's just, I don't like it when we just automatically think everything they're doing is perfect and rosy 
and should be supported without any holding it up to even the law of God to see if that's the case. Do you think some of the some of that or through the Gentile and these other other religions that they look up to to the to the Jewish law that they get that God gave them the Ten Commandments and say, hey, this is how the Jews and this is how we should be conducting ourselves. It's a sin to kill somebody and they feel judgmental about that so they don't like the Jews because of them laws, especially the last six laws that are the Ten Commandments and they don't like that because they don't want to feel guilty of it. So you think there's any animosity because of that? I don't think that, because I mean, the, because the church is very heavy on the Ten Commandments as well, but you don't see the same type of anti, you know, Semitism with anti-Christianity, uh, so that it'd be like, oh, it's just the Ten Commandments that brings it about. I really do think that there's, there's a lot of perceived privilege. I mean, it's like now you get the thing that, you know, there's white privilege, there's different privilege, and when somebody perceives privilege of another thing, then you start to be jealous, and uh, and that's all stuff that God's going to have to work out in the end, because there are, I mean, there are favoritisms, there are things like that that occur in this world, um, and there are injustices and, and, and all of that stuff. Um, Israel today, um, you know, one of the things I, I look, look at and wonder about um, is that God uh, said in Ezekiel, well, I think it's Ezekiel, sometimes uh, translate, I will punish you doubly, mm -hmm. you know, I'll bring you in the land and punish you doubly, or it's, I'll bring you in, in the land and punish you again. So is, you know, as it's been gathered together again, why is it gathered again? And why is it still here? Well, because God said, until the stars cease to hang in their place, this nation will exist. So that means it's going to exist. There's no way around that it's going to exist. Uh, um, but there's also that double expectation of if you are a Jew and you do not come to follow the, your true Messiah, you're doubly accountable to that in, in when it comes down to God's discipline as well. Um, and I think, you know, with the, the current um, state of Israel being primarily atheistic, being primarily anti uh, their own Messiah um, and, and such like that, uh, that there's a lot of that would that is you know destined for judgment, not destined for uh, conversion. Although the hope is the same as in Romans um, 11, that all you know as much of Israel can be saved as will be saved. It's how much more beautiful uh, that is. Um, it's just it's just the what I've seen myself is I've seen people who um, who don't have a balanced and nuanced view of that. It's just very simple. It's like Israel can do no wrong. And we should do support Israel in everything that it says, almost on just a political side, and not so much taking in the biblical nuances of what's all happening there. Um, and I'm definitely not advocating being against them. I'm, I'm not in that camp either. Um, it's just we have to be careful as to you know how much we just readily accept that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, with the church history, do you know why they kind of left this part about the Jewish Civil War out? Is that just because they didn't um, believe in, or they didn't think that Josephus was, I mean, they were just bad at him, right? Well, understand that in America, in the Western Evangelical Church, we've left this part out. In church history, this has been well known. I mean, you, you read back to the Puritans, they're, they're naming all the stuff, they're telling what happened, they know who, how the destruction you know, the temple happened in 70 AD and stuff like that. We've left it out in American I always knew that the Romans like were the final cause of the destruction of the temple, but I had no idea that the Civil War part was going on at all. I yeah. couldn't involve. New. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's um, a big a big part of that, you know, is during the Great Awakenings, um, there were a lot of people that began to, you know, not so much the First Great Awakening, but Second and Third Great Awakenings, people were able to go out and just preach, having no education, no background in theology, nothing like that. They just go out and preach at a tent meeting. They're loved and everybody follows them. And, and a lot of our denominations started that way in America. It was just, you know, people, and, and that's why 
you got to have it this way, this way, and we, we divided and divided and divided. But a lot of those, a lot of those traditions were anti-academic. Because what happened when they were out preaching is the people that did have a theological degree, the people that were trained, would come back and go, well, that's not accurate because there's this that happened in Israel. Or that's not accurate because this is what the language says. Well, that's not accurate because of this. And, there. and the way that they pushed back against that was by becoming anti-academic. I grew up in a church where seminary was called cemetery because it's where you went for your faith to die. And uh, it was usually a, a point of... Um, prowess that you were preaching and never went to seminary hmm. Hmm. and that's very typical in a lot of the different baptistic and and some of those other denominations um and uh and of course guys would then go to seminary learn this background history and then come back and go yeah i've kind of changed my mind They're like see it corrupts you when you go to seminary oh. so it, it it fed that and so within america there was a lot more anti-knowledge uh, tradition so that we didn't, we stopped teaching this in, in those evangelical seminaries because we had to create our own seminaries that, that do this. Now, once you start studying this, then you start going, wait a minute, maybe this stuff could be fulfilling this prophecy instead of this thing in the future. Maybe this could be this, and maybe this could fulfill this. And then you, and what happened for me personally was as I studied and got to know this, my view started to change, and I'm like, I've got, I, I've got this whole new view, and it's, and it's like I've never heard it before, and it's so great. I can't wait to go teach it. And only the, then to be talking to some Presbyterian pastor, and he's like, Well, what's your view? And I told him, He's like, Dwayne, that's basically reformed. I'm like, no, it's not. He's like, Yeah, it is. I'm like, No. And I went, and sure enough, it, it was nothing new under the sun, which in the end is encouraging because new theology is not a good idea. Um, but you to see that they had already kind of come to that, and I had come to that understanding without somebody talking me into it. Um, but then I realized just how solid that was once you knew the history. But then I wanted to go back to my the school size. I was like, why didn't you tell me this stuff? Why didn't you teach me about this? And uh, but they're still not, and, and that's uh, a sad part of some of our schools right now. I mean, why would they think like that? You know, you need to, you need to direct from the Hebrews, I mean, to Hosea 4, 6, that says, my people are perishing for a lack of knowledge. You can never have too much knowledge concerning the scriptures, right? Right. But no. the problem was is that guys taught a whole bunch of stuff without the knowledge That's and the stuck knowledge. their neck out and weren't afraid to humbly say I was wrong. You can imagine how often we come to that point. And that's, that's why. And, and what's scary is you go to all these different denominations and they have all these, you know, these are the men that founded our denomination and things like that. It's like, yeah, but how come they couldn't come to unity with each other? How come they couldn't love each other as brothers in Christ? Why did you let all this stuff divide you? Pride and letting that into the church and, uh, and get that. And, and unfortunately, our missionaries spread some of that when they went out at times. And you have that division, you know, elsewhere. And so it's it's a lamentable thing. That's one of the reasons why I really like the denomination we are in, because this doctrinal statement does not stand on any of that stuff and boot you out because you don't agree on this minutia. It, it allows you, here's the stuff that is absolutely clear in Scripture where you know, godly people have always agreed that's what we stand on, and that's why I chose to be in the EFCK. All right. Thank you. See you guys next week.